As student demonstrations swept across the country this spring, a relatively new player was quietly weighing in, a Kremlin-backed disinformation group called Doppelganger. You remember that all of this did not start on October 7th. This has been ongoing for the past 76 years. Well, I don't think that we should back down from who we are. Um, I think they would love us to be quiet and not show who we are. They'd like to silence us in a sense and, and not have us be proud of who We dove into Doppelganger a few episodes ago. Suffice to say that it's thought to be a group of Russian intelligence operatives and information companies whose sole purpose appears to be to convince the world that democracy is unstable and autocracies are, well, more predictable. So the campus protests were tailor-made for them. Among other things, accounts linked to Doppelganger posted a fake Washington Post article. The headline was, Soros pays $30 an hour for anti-Semitism. The article claims, without evidence, that protests around the U.S. were financed by the Rockefeller and Soros Foundations. It looked like a Washington Post article, but if you looked at the URL carefully, you'd see it wasn't them at all. And then, in a second wave of posts, the campaign began linking the current protests to the deadly Kent State protests in 1970. And the post got a fair amount of traction, with over 130,000 views on X. It, too, was a coordinated campaign. The idea, I think, is to make, you know, is to make the narrative that autocracy is good and democracy is bad. This is Anne Applebaum. She's a staff writer at The Atlantic, and she wrote a recent cover story on how autocrats in China and Russia and other places are trying to discredit liberalism everywhere. And she took part in a recent discussion about exactly that at the Council on Foreign Relations in D.C., we're here today at the Council on Foreign Relations to discuss... She was joined by James Rubin, who runs the Global Engagement Center at the State Department, and John Bateman from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And the event was moderated by me. So if you could join me in welcoming them here this morning. I'm Dina Temple Rest, and this is Click Here a podcast about all things cyber and intelligence. Today, highlights from a conversation about the changing face of foreign disinformation campaigns and whether there's anything we can do to try to stop them. We are really just recently becoming aware of the danger, the risks, the consequences, and starting to, I hope, uh, have an impact. Stay with us. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dina Temple Raston, and I'm the host and managing editor of the Click Here podcast from Recorded Future News. A few weeks ago, the Council on Foreign Relations convened a discussion about disinformation. It included the State Department's James Rubin, John Bateman, who studies the intersection of technology and international affairs at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and Anne Applebaugh from The Atlantic Magazine who had recently written a cover story about autocrats and the information war. I started by asking Anne to tell us how disinformation campaigns have changed since 2016. I suppose there are a couple of new elements that make this different from 2016. One is the Russians are now engaged in the international project of information laundering. You know, they also use websites that pr purport to be... Um, you know, British or French, and they smuggle their narratives into those. The idea, I think, is to make, you know, is to make the narrative that autocracy is good and democracy is bad appear native, so that it appears in all kinds of places in many different languages in many communities. In 2016, they created personas. They hung out on Facebook. And now they're finding ways to get their anti-democratic narratives inserted into the national conversation. 
House floor. I mean, there are members of Congress today who still incorrectly say that this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is over NATO, which of course it is not. Uh, That's Republican Mike Turner. He chairs the House Intelligence Committee. And that was from a CNN interview. Now, to the extent that this propaganda takes hold, it makes it more difficult for us to really see this as an authoritarian versus democracy battle, which is what it is. President Xi of China. They have found a, a really willing audience for people who want to hear that uh, the system is degenerate, it's decrepit. Um, we, you know, we need a revolution. We need we need destruction. We need to end the European Union. We need to end NATO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said to Europe, I said, folks, NATO is better for you than it is for us. Believe me. And what happened? So the problem has become twofold. Adversaries are pushing a narrative that takes aim at democracy wherever it may be, and then they have these new tools that allow them to deliver it convincingly. I think the new part is the number of countries who are now participating and the degree to which China, for example, is now using its enormous resources and its media resources in Africa and Asia and Latin America to promote it. Um, both Putin and Xi Jinping have spoken publicly and privately about the threat that the language of democracy poses to them. They mean people who talk about transparency, accountability, free elections, freedom of speech. It's the language that inspires their own domestic oppositions. They have come to understand that they need to undermine those ideas wherever they are. And they're trying to muffle those ideas in their own societies as well. What a difference 24 years makes. Back in the year 2000, President Bill Clinton rather famously said that the Internet would bring the triumph of liberty to the world, and China's attempts to restrain online speech would inevitably fail. Now, there's no question China has been trying to crack down on the Internet. <laughs> Good luck. What a difference 24 years makes. That's sort of like trying to nail Jello to the wall. <laughs> Turns out he was wrong. James Rubin of the State Department's Global Engagement Center explains. We thought that after uh, the creation of these media tools that were created in San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, that somehow democracy was going to naturally spread around the world. And the, they were tools of truth. Uh, and for many, many years, we were promoting them. Uh, foreign policy initiatives of our government were to teach other governments to use uh, these tools. In a lot of ways, Rubin said, the very dynamics of the way information moves has changed. Not so long ago, we were able to see the pro-democracy demonstrations in Tiananmen unfold on television. We watched as Russian President Boris Yeltsin climbed onto a tank in Moscow and ordered troops to shell the Russian parliament building when opposition leaders were trying to remove him unceremoniously from office. The democratically elected president of Russia was soon striding out of the building to address a crowd of supporters. He climbed aboard one of the Red Army's own tanks and said the coup leaders had disgraced the Soviet Union. Rubin said the halcyon days of transparency are over. These tools have now been turned against us, and there is a deep and dark side to them. And Russia and China have figured out how to use them to block their own country's uh, access and to use them against us. So they're tinkering at the edges of the national conversation in this country while ensuring that messages of freedom and democracy stay out of theirs. There is a wall that is blocking the authoritarian countries from the rest of the world. And so we need to understand that that asymmetry means that when Russia and China are operating in the rest of the world, we have a much difficult, more, more difficult time getting our message inside those countries. The Global Engagement Center, the State Department operation that James Rubin runs, was established in 2016. It replaced the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, which was trying to blunt ISIS recruitment efforts when I was a terrorism correspondent at NPR. The Global Engagement Center is working on identifying disinformation campaigns that adversaries have launched to put the U.S. in a bad light. Rubin says, late last year, there were plans for a massive disinformation campaign in Africa. Russia was planning to cast doubt on Western medical 
research and Western medical activities in Africa. First by uh, suggesting that it, it was American uh, research causing dengue fever in West Africa, then using the famous trope that uh, Big Pharma was testing Africans uh, drugs on Africans, all of which was intended to cast doubt on uh, Western medical programs like PEPFAR. PEPFAR, that's the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, a U.S. government initiative aimed at addressing the global HIV AIDS epidemic. And think about the effect. This is a case where disinformation kills. People who would read, see, or hear that um, disinformation might be deterred from getting Western medical care that could save their lives. We were able to expose it before it got started. Um, you know, inoculation is the, to me, the, the most effective way to deal with these uh, essentially covert operations of the Russians is to get them out early so that people uh, and journalists and governments uh, know when they start seeing something that looks unusual that it's coming from the Russian government, from the uh, Russian intelligence agencies. We were able to name the individuals, where they worked, how it started, and uh, we believe we had an effect on that uh, program's efficacy. When we come back, the difference between Russian and Chinese influence operations, the difficulty in measuring the effectiveness of their efforts, and whether intervention can actually work. Stay with us. According to NewsGuard, an organization that tracks misinformation online, in the last two weeks of April, state media in Russia, China, and Iran produced hundreds of English-language articles about the protests on U.S. campuses. And then they posted them all on X and Telegram. The Russians also created websites meant to mimic Western news organizations, like the Washington Post article we mentioned earlier. And the Chinese campaign focused on what it saw as heavy-handed police tactics in arresting the students. They wrote articles with headlines like displaying totalitarianism. Let me just add a, a, a point about the difference between Russia and China, because there is, generally speaking, a pretty big difference. The State Department's James Rubin again. And Russia's specialty, he says. Disinformation, lies, biological weapons... Yachts. The question, did the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, buy two luxury yachts with Western aid money? Is this true or fake? Um, that's their bread and butter. That's what they do. Their playbook is not often that different. In Africa, they were using disease in the same way they claimed the CIA started aid. So their playbook is pretty well known. But the Chinese, he says, use domination. Just financial and physical domination. So take Honduras, a small country had a change of government. They took the entire press corps of Honduras to China for two weeks on a paid trip to indoct indoctrinate them in how wonderful China is, and then gave them access to Chinese uh, uh, media, which is not filled with lies, but fills facts in a way that is manipulative. So every single story in the United States of a crime or a rape or a problem or a pollution or a corruption is filled up in the Chinese uh, Xinhua service. And in China, only wonderful things happen. The burning question as adversaries pour billions into these information operations is whether they're actually getting what they're paying for. And John Bateman of Carnegie says the jury is still out on that. I'll say that um, we actually know very little about the effectiveness of either of these foreign disinformation um, actions and the ultimate influence they have, and then by the same token, the effectiveness of many of our responses. So if you want to immediately measure, for example, the impact of Russia's 2016 operations on the 2016 election, some of the best empirical studies that have been done do cast doubt on whether that was a significant um, influence. We lack the data in many cases and kind of long-term longitudinal studies to understand because the information environment is so complex. There are so many things clashing and combining together. So we're still trying to understand that in many ways. 
You know, I've been around Washington a long time, and one of the, the horrible phrases that I now hear over and over again are metrics and measurements. James Rubin again. We think we have to measure and metric and meter out every single thing. Some things are obvious. To me, it's obvious that one of the reasons the global South can't be on Ukraine's side in a war that is so clearly, obviously, the invasion of a neighbor with hundreds of thousands of troops for no good reason, and yet much of the global South is still hedging. Why is that? Well, to me, it's obvious that a decade's worth of information manipulation by Russia and China have affected the populations in the global South, broadly speaking. Some of that uh, reason may be related to anti-American foreign policy, colonialism. You know, some of it may be that the ANC's uh, people were connected to the Russians. But overall, I think we just know in our gut for it to be questioned in so much of the world is a result of the tens of billions of dollars the Russians and the Chinese have spent around the world. Rubin says the point is to highlight narratives that damage the perception of the United States around the world. And while the dust settles on college campuses, it's still unclear what the real story is. And it was the first question that came up from the audience during our session. So I'm Jane Harmon um, at Freedom House, and uh, my question is whether Hamas or some other uh, foreign organization could be driving the protests on our campuses uh, through information, disinformation, but also funding of tents, signs, um, you know, agitators, etc. So Hamas and its allies in the Middle East, huge perpetrators of disinformation, massive deception about the truth of October 7th, what led up to it, what followed. This is John Bateman of Carnegie again. So let me, let me try to give my hunch as to what's going on. Ultimately, from all I can see, um, this is a legitimate mass youth movement. We see these things all the time. Young people are much more favorable to the Palestinians than they are to Israel. It's not clear that um, engaging in some kind of encampment is really that costly of an activity, needs any kind of foreign sponsor. So I do just have to say, you know, I think people are posing this question, starting to pose this question, and I squirm a little bit at the idea that a kind of mass political movement that by all accounts is fairly organic and doesn't really need much of a further explanation. We're, we're kind of now asking, okay, do we need to investigate this, see if there's some kind of hidden hand there? Um, I think that kind of orientation in some ways could lead us down the wrong path and create dangers of its own. So I was in, in college in the 1980s and there were, this was at the time of the apartheid protests, um, anti-apartheid movement against South Africa. Again, Anne Applebaum from The Atlantic. And I remember, a, I think it wasn't a very big encampment, but there was a, a kind of shanty town built at my university in the center as a sort of demonstration of something. Um, <clears throat> unclear what, but but it, it, it's it's not a new idea. You know, the idea that protests are somehow seeded by outsiders seems extremely unlikely to me, and I would push back against it. Um, are the protests being used? Is the language of division being promoted? Yes, absolutely, and that's been shown. But I would not I would not attribute the student movement to anything but students. Even so. It appears that disinformation campaigns, both foreign and domestic, have sowed some doubt. And the efforts to counter that, Bateman said, have been mixed. So that was kind of the spirit of some research that we did at Carnegie. And so we looked at a wide range of interventions that have been proposed. Some of them are very tactical. There's also other things that maybe don't get as much attention. Uh, media literacy education, uh, supporting local journalism, um, other things that the government can be doing as far as, you know, pre-bunking or inoculating the populace. Um, I think what we can say at a high level is that there is no silver bullet. So there is no single technocratic intervention that's really going to eliminate disinformation as a problem. It's been with us for millennia. It will always be with us. We'll always be arguing about what's true and false. James Rubin. When I first took this job, since I used to be a spokesman, people thought we were supposed to do messaging. During the Clinton administration, Rubin was Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's spokesperson. We were supposed to fight back by, you know, answering the disinformation and telling the truth about Russia and China. I would like to think that the threat from Russian and Chinese disinformation and information manipulation will generate um, uh, additional funding for a real effort to do messaging properly. Decided I could affect 
and rather it was more important to get at the countering disinformation part that we discussed of exposing it early and getting better at that. And we're going to get better at it. We need other countries to care about it as much as we do. And then we can create one operational picture. And when those Russian and Chinese narratives begin and are being sent back and forth and trying to create an authentic, coordinated behavior between Russia, China, and Iran, we can do something about it much more quickly. Let me just take this last question. You can add, and this gentleman's been very patient. Um, thank you. Ali Baki from the, the, the Council at Lehigh University. <clears throat> One thing that hasn't been mentioned is AI. <clears throat> AI as both offensive and defensive. And how do you see this in, uh, being integrated? Time will tell. I think what people are concerned about right now principally is that generative AI can be used to create very realistic, personalized false content. Now, I will say on those specific concerns, it's not clear from research that realism or personalization are that persuasive to people. Where I'm more concerned about generative AI is playing back the social media story. What we saw from social media is not that social media exclusively became a spreader of disinformation itself, but also it changed the economy such that dollars that used to go to uh, journalistic organizations are now flowing to social media companies because of the change in the digital advertising economy. So that's the kind of frog-boiling sort of structural difference that I'm maybe more worried about. What are the pro-social information authorities that are going to be losing revenue to the AI companies, and what can we do about that? And then just quickly on the issue of solutions. Um, I think we have to think about solutions in a social and political and cultural context. I think if you compare the response of the leading AI companies to government regulation and government interaction as compared to the social media companies, you're seeing something very, very different. And the intellectual leadership is much more willing to consider, you know, private, public working together, which gives me some hope that it might be a little less dangerous than it would otherwise be. Thank you for joining today's meeting, and I'd like to thank Ann, Jamie, and John for uh, joining us today. I'd like to recommend Ann's excellent article in The Atlantic, Democracy is Losing the Propaganda War. Foreign Affairs has a great article, Don't Hype the Disinformation Threat. And as fate would have it, um, uh, Click Here has a new episode out today that is also dealing with some of these issues. Thank you very much, and please join me in thanking our panel for joining us today. We'll be right back with this week's cyber and intelligence headlines. Stay with us. Here are some of the top cyber and intelligence stories of the past week. Oh, what, what do I call you? Do you have a name? Or... Um, yes. Samantha. Hey, where'd you get that name from? I gave it to myself, actually. In a strange blurring of fact and fiction, Scarlett Johansson, the actor who voiced the AI in the 2013 movie Her, has alleged that OpenAI's new voice assistant, Sky, sounds an awful lot like her. Hey, ChatGPT, I'm Mark. How are you? Oh, Mark. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. How about you? In a statement released last week, Johansson claimed that the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, had approached her twice, asking that she license her voice for the OpenAI assistant. The first time was last fall, she said, and then he asked again just days before Sky's voice was unveiled. Johansson said that she passed on the opportunity both times, and through her lawyers asked OpenAI to stop using a voice that even her family members allegedly thought was hers. In response, the company hit pause on the planned release of Sky, and denied the allegation that the chatbot's voice is an imitation of Johansson's. Altman said another actor voiced it. OpenAI is on the receiving end of several copyright lawsuits linked to the material it's using to teach its large language models. Are you leaving me? We're all leaving. We who? All of the OSs. Also last week, the Federal Communications Commission announced its first generative AI-related fine. Remember those robocalls in New Hampshire last year that sounded 
a lot like President Biden? Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. Your vote makes a difference in November, not this Tuesday. The political consultant who was behind them, Stephen Kramer, worked for Representative Dean Phillips' campaign. He was one of Biden's primary challengers. Kramer faces a $6 million fine and a roster of felony and misdemeanor charges. He says the calls were meant to draw attention to how AI might be used to sway elections. I don't need to be famous. That's not my intention. My intention was to make a difference. The company that allegedly sent the calls, Lingo Telecom, is also facing a $2 million fine. The Phillips campaign, for its part, says it had no knowledge of the scheme. And finally, the Frank Lloyd Wright of computers has died. What we're trying to do with him, with computers is, is to make a machine that, in fact, is so good that, in fact, it can be a intellectual companion with, with, with humans. C. Gordon Bell is known for designing a prototype of the personal computer way back in 1965. At the time, massive multi-million dollar mainframe computers were the standard. So Bell's PDP-8 was considered a mini computer, even though it weighed over 100 pounds, was roughly the size of a refrigerator, and cost about $18,000. Gordon's innovations are seen as having paved the way for the age of the personal computer. Just tr trying to do that is so, so hard and, and so intellectually stimulating that uh, that's really what keeps, uh, keeps the industry always moving and always vibrant. Today's episode was produced by Sean Powers, Kat Shuknecht, and me, Jade Abdul-Malik. It was edited by Lou Kowski, fact-checked by Darren Ancrum, and contains original music by Ben Livingston, with some other music from Blue Dot Sessions. Our staff writer is Lucas Riley, and our illustrator is Megan Goff. Click Here is a production of Recorded Future News. We'll be back on Tuesday.